Neuhauser, who's an investigator here at uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, will uh, kick this off. So let's see if this is. Thank you, Seth. Good morning, everyone. the highlights from the past year, and there have actually been two major reports on lifestyle factors and prostate cancer risk. The first one is something that you may have heard about in the news over the past month. It was a scientific report of the 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, and there's a, a website link which you can um, look at if you're interested. This was just released in February, just uh, not quite two months ago, and I had the privilege to be on this uh, committee. And for the very first time, the report included substantial diet-related cancer prevention evidence, including for prostate cancer. Um, every five years, the United States renews our dietary guidelines, which essentially acts as the nutrition policy piece or gets turned into the nutrition policy piece for the United States, and it's always been cardiovascular driven. And so that's why you've probably heard some of the recommendations, for instance, about dietary fat intake or sodium and so forth, because it's always been cardiovascular disease driven. This time, for the very first time, they recruited uh, two people with cancer expertise to be on the committee, myself, and another quite well-known uh, prostate cancer researcher, Dr. Steve Clinton from The Ohio State University. So we were very pleased that we were able to thoroughly review the evidence as it relates to cancer prevention, including prostate cancer prevention. And in a few moments, I'll tell you about some of the highlights from the report. The other major report that came out in the fall was the World Cancer Research Fund's report on diet physical activity and prostate cancer. And the World Cancer Research Fund is a, um, it's a UK organization and it partners with a group in the United States called the American Institute for Cancer Research. And they now um, have committees that review all the scientific evidence for specific cancers. And I was not on this committee, but Dr. Clinton was on this prostate committee for um, WCRF and they came up with very similar recommendations as we did uh, in the United States. So for the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, a major focus was to examine dietary patterns instead of isolated nutrients. A few times when I've come here in the past to speak with you on, on these yearly um, symposiums, I might have talked to you about some specific isolated nutrients, including vitamin D, um, calories, dietary fat, and so forth. What we really wanted to emphasize this time in the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee was the entire dietary pattern, with the thought that the whole is more than the sum of its parts, because that's what the evidence is starting to tell us. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. So what are dietary patterns? We define dietary patterns as the quantities, proportions, variety or combination of different foods, drinks, nutrients when those data are available in diets and the frequency with which they are habitually consumed. So why study dietary patterns instead of these isolated nutrients? Well, first of all, diets are very complex. People eat foods and meals, not nutrients, so there's a better sense that we can perhaps translate our scientific information to patients and the public in a more coherent manner if we talk about dietary patterns rather than these isolated nutrients. Secondly, there's a lot of correlation among dietary constituents, meaning that if someone eats, um, say, a lot of dietary fat, often that particular nutrient commingles with refined grains and added sugars and things like that. So these things are not in isolation. Foods are always a combination of a lot of different nutrients. And the analysis from a statistical standpoint of single nutrients may be confounded by the effect of the dietary pattern. 
Another important point with regard to studying dietary patterns is that a lot of clinical trials, which are studies where we might randomize people to one diet or another, they have shown very positive health outcomes for changes in total diet, where we, in other words, where we advise someone to follow, say, the DASH diet, which you might have heard of. That's called the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. That was kind of a comprehensive overall dietary intervention that emphasized fruits and vegetables, low sodium, low fat dairy, and so forth. And this is one of the most exciting dietary interventions that's ever happened because this is an excellent example of how research gets translated into patient care. So the DASH diet um, first came out, the trial was first published you know, more than um, 15 years ago. And now when people go to their physician and they might have a little bit of elevated blood pressure or some other risk factors, they're told to follow the DASH diet. So it's really become part of clinical practice. So this is the direction that we would like to go with prostate cancer prevention as well, this kind of thing. Another study called the Lyon Diet Heart Study had a similar type of approach, and there were very effective results from these whole diet packages as opposed to single nutrients. So how do we evaluate dietary patterns? In the work that I've been doing over the last couple of years, we use several different approaches that you can see here. Oh, it looks like this is not working. So the DASH eating pattern is one that I mentioned that emphasizes fruits and vegetables, low-fat dairy, whole grains, minimal, minimal amounts of um, highly processed foods, including refined grains. And when we do research studies and ask people to report on their diet, we can break down the foods and see how well, just on a free living basis, they already adhere to this DASH eating pattern. We have something called the Healthy Eating Index, which is a way to score someone's diet 100 points. Great, thank you. The Healthy Eating Index is designed to be more or less of a score that tells, tells us how well someone adheres to uh, the dietary guidelines for Americans. And on average, the average American has a score of about uh, 55 to 60, where 100 points is a perfect diet and zero points is a pretty lousy diet. So we do have some room to grow, but the healthy eating index is, is one of these scoring systems that more or less scores the whole diet. And then we have uh, the Mediterranean diet and then an alternate version of the Mediterranean diet. And the Mediterranean diet is another sort of scoring system because it's been observed that People who live in the Mediterranean region have lower rates of cardiovascular disease, and there's probably a variety of reasons for that, including genetics, physical activity, and diet is probably one uh, reason. And the Mediterranean diet is rich in fish, uh, low-fat dairy, whole grains, and so forth. So what we found um, in doing the uh, evidence review for the Dietary Guidelines uh, Advisory Committee that the common characteristics of dietary patterns that were associated with positive health outcomes included a higher intake of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, low-fat dairy, fish and seafood, legumes, lean meat, and nuts, and moderate intake of alcohol. People always ask, well, what is moderate? Uh, for men, it's no more than two drinks a day. Less is better. Uh, for women, it's no more than one drink a day. Also, lower consumption of red and processed meat and low intake of sugar-sweetened foods and beverages and refined grains. So some specifics. You might be asking, well, what is processed meat? I hear that term all the time. What does that mean? Well, processed meat is things like bacon, hot dogs, sausage, cold cuts. It's meats that have been cured. And we don't really want to get into the weeds of what it is about these processed meats that might be harmful. It could be um, the nitrates that are used to cure the meat. It could be the high sodium. It could be it's high in fat or it's cooked at a high temperature or all of those. But what we know is as a whole, consuming a lot of processed meat can be harmful. 
How do you know if a grain is a whole grain? Well, you need to look at the labels. Look for something that says 100% whole wheat, barley with the hull. So pearled barley has the hull taken off. It's not a whole grain. So the barley has to have the hull on it. Brown rice, steel oats, bulgur wheat, wheat berries, anything that has that outer um, endosperm on it um, is considered a whole grain. How about added sugars? How do you know if something has added sugars? Well, added sugars likes to get um, disguised as many different names. I'm sure you've heard of corn syrup and high fructose corn syrup, but now a lot of company, companies are using ev evaporated cane, cane juice, even brown rice syrup. So you think, oh, this is healthy. It has brown rice. No, the brown rice has been boiled and boiled and boiled and just distilled down until it's nothing but a syrupy mess and that's used as the sweetener. So that's considered an added sugar. Even fruit syrups, and I don't mean 100% fruit juice that you can drink and it's perfectly healthy, but when they boil it down and boil it down and boil it down until there's nothing left but a syrup, that's considered an added sugar. Uh, cane sugar, beet sugar, the list goes you know, on and on and on. So label reading can be quite important. So for dietary patterns and prostate cancer, what we found on the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee is that these findings do apply to prostate cancer prevention, but there were far fewer papers. There were you know, um, many, many published findings on colorectal cancer and breast cancer. So we really need more research in this area to support strong recommendations for prostate cancer prevention. But in the meantime, we do believe that these recommendations will be effective. So I mentioned the World Cancer Research Fund Prostate Cancer Report. This project is very similar in nature to the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee in that there is systematic review of the published literature on diet, physical activity, and prostate cancer risk, and experts around the globe comprise the committee. And one of the major conclusions was related to the relationship of body weight and adiposity and prostate cancer risk. And what they found was they examined all these studies that had been published on body mass index or adiposity and prostate cancer risk. And if you look at this diamond down here at the bottom, this is called the overall summary of all the data. And so for every... Um, five kilogram per meter square increase in BMI. So basically that means when you're moving from normal weight to overweight or overweight to obese, you have an 8% 8, 8 increased risk of prostate cancer. So confirms uh, previous findings that body weight is related to risk. They were also able to examine waist circumference and there were fewer studies available but most of them were consistent and showed an increased risk. So if you have a higher um, waist circumference or more abdominal girth, that probably increases your risk more than body weight alone. So here's the increased risk for the waist circumference. So some summary and major take home points. Remember that the whole is more than the sum of its parts as far as dietary intake goes. And this is really important because you can have Brussels sprouts for dinner and think, oh great, I'm getting my vegetables. But if you had Cheetos and a Coke for lunch and that was all you had for lunch, you have to think about the whole dietary pattern. I can't really say that it would necessarily be negated, but what you eat for lunch is just as important as what you have for dinner. So continue to have your vegetables, but think about the whole dietary pattern, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. A dietary pattern that's rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low-fat dairy, lean meats, non-meat proteins, including legumes and nuts. Legumes are some of the best foods we have. They're just fantastic. And, and foods that have minimal added sugars and refined grains is a healthy pattern. So think about the whole pattern, what you're eating on a day-in and day-out basis, and don't get hung up too much in isolated nutrients. There is no single food, nutrient, or dietary supplement pill or any ingredient that will uniformly and consistently reduce risk. The whole dietary pattern is important. There's nothing magic 
about a particular supplement or about a particular food ingredient. You might have seen some talk on um, TV or read in magazines about so-called superfoods. Superfoods are okay because they're another way to think about a nutrient-dense food where we get a lot of nutrients in one food, but they're not magic. You know, don't, don't think of foods as having a magical attribute. It's the whole dietary pattern that will keep you healthy. So also maintain a healthy weight. And you may get tired of me saying this. I said the same thing last year, but it's really important. So maintain a healthy weight. Exercise at least 30 minutes a day. It can be walking or anything else that you enjoy. Do it rain or shine. Do it every day, 30 minutes. More if you can do it or if you have time, but at least... 30 minutes every single day. Find a walking or exercise partner, especially if it's raining. You want to take a walk? Make that date with that person. Say, we're going to go, rain or shine. You know, we're going to do it every day. So that's it, and now I'll turn it over to uh, John. We didn't tell you at lunch, but we're all going for a 30-minute 30 30 walk outside. <laughs> Dr. Gore. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces. Um, I'm actually standing up here uh, on behalf of a research program that's led by Ruth Etzioni, but she unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, and I want to talk about screening for prostate cancer, which is an issue that incites a lot of passion. Um, but um, what I want to represent is what um, we and Ruth's group have done to try to do more of a critical evaluation of some of the screening concerns. So in 2012, there was this landmark statement from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force that recommends against routine screening with PSA, with the prostate-specific antigen test. Um, and their rationale kind of came down to a number of bullet points. So number one, there was a big screening trial in the U.S. that did not show any benefit to screening. Number two, there was a, a concurrent large trial in Europe that did show a benefit, but this is a number that you see cited a lot by members of the USPSTF, that really you save one life out of a thousand in this sort of at-risk aged population. And so in their mind, that's not, a, that's not a really substantial number. So even though it showed benefit, that absolute benefit was relatively small. Um, when you look at all-cause mortality, so death from any cause, not just from prostate cancer, it was similar in patients who got screened with PSA as those who did not. Um, and, you know, the concern about prostate cancer screening is that in detecting a number of cancers that maybe would not have put people at risk for dying from prostate cancer, you're also putting men at risk of the harms of prostate biopsy, prostate cancer treatment, uh, and so this, this notion of harms was, was very important. So what is overdiagnosis? Um, and I've heard comments before from some of you in the audience about sort of overdiagnosis being a little bit of a concerning term uh, because, you know, maybe in your opinion, any diagnosis is an important diagnosis. And so the term overdiagnosis may sort of undermine your experience as a prostate cancer patient. But from a technical sort of epidemiologic standpoint, we're talking about prostate cancer cases where that patient may never have died of their prostate cancer. So I just want to take the emotion out of it and just, just make it a technical term. Um, and that might be up to half of the cases that are detected by PSA screening. And so when you look at the European trial, that means that you are detecting, you are diagnosing an additional 48 men for every cancer that, that might have caused death from prostate cancer. Now, we're going to critically evaluate that number, but that's what was highlighted by the USPSTF. There are a number of false positive tests. So there are a number of tests where um, you go through several screening rounds um, and you don't find prostate cancer in that patient. So PSA has a high false positive rate. Um, biopsy is not innocuous. So prostate biopsy, you know, if your prostate were just this organ sticking off your shoulder, biopsy would not be a big deal. But there are life-threatening infections that can occur with prostate biopsy, so we can't just sort of disregard prostate biopsy as a, a simple procedure. And, you know, the notable tre tr uh, treatment harms, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in the second session as well, include things like urinary incontinence, bowel dysfunction, which is more common after radiation, sexual dysfunction, things that truly impact men's quality of life. So, 
When you look at what's happened in the prostate cancer landscape since the 1990s, there has been an irrefutable, so no one can really argue this, decline in deaths from prostate cancer since the 1990s, since around the time the PSA test was introduced into clinical practice. And that decline is about half. Um, and so that's an important decline, but when you look at what the USPSTF attributes uh, this to, they talk about all the sort of radical changes we've been able to make in treatment for prostate cancer since the 1990s. We now have robotic prostatectomy. Some people call um, certain types of radiation therapy robotic radiation, you know, proton beam radiation, really cool therapies that we think maybe are more effective at treating prostate cancer. Well, we did a bit of a critical evaluation of this, and it's true that the treatment patterns for prostate cancer have changed. So this is, this is before my time as a doc, but it used to be that prostatectomy, removal of the prostate, was sort of one of the rarer forms of treatment for prostate cancer. As PSA came about and techniques changed, surgery came, uh, became more common. The type of radiation we use now is higher dose radiation than it used to be. We combine radiation with hormones because we know that's better and more effective than radiation alone. So we've learned a lot, it's true, in the last 20 years about how to more effectively treat prostate cancer. So if we use modeling, because this is not something where we can do a natural experiment, that would take forever. If we use modeling and we say, well, gosh, if there were no changes to how we treated prostate cancer from the 80s, then this yellow line of prostate mor uh, cancer mortality is what we would be looking at today. Mortality probably would have plateaued. It would not have, have continued to increase. If we look at the treatment changes that have been made since the 1990s and we model that impact on population mortality, it definitely causes a decrease. So if we model those treatment changes, we don't just say, well, gosh, treatment's better. If we actually model those changes, yes, mortality would have improved. But there's a huge gap here. That improvement still does not account for what we actually saw in the United States. So what might account for that treatment? Well, if we include the benefit of screening that was seen in the European trial, now it's starting to look more like what we see in the U.S. So it's actually not accurate to say that this is just simply attributable to the changes that we've seen in treatment. Screening probably has uh, an effect. And, and these next couple slides talk about the lifetime of a prostate cancer patient. So the, the one in a thousand that was highlighted by the task force reflects the European trial that was nine years of follow-up. So nine years in a prostate cancer lifetime is relatively short. And so when you talk to members of the task force today, they still cite this one in a thousand, 48 to one ratio. But when we look at the same European trial after 11 years, so now we're looking at longer term follow-up. Now we're seeing more patients in the unscreened population, those that did not get PSA, more of them are dying of their prostate cancer, those numbers start to go down. And if we use our models, those same models um, led by Dr. Etzioni, and we say, well, gosh, 11 years is not enough either. Let's go to a lifetime. Let's go to 20 years and beyond. Those numbers go way down even more. And now the number of prostate cancer patients that you diagnose with prostate cancer relative to the number that may die from their prostate cancer goes from 48 to 1 to 6 to 1. And that's a remarkable benefit, and that's something that not uh, enough people are discussing. So this critical evaluation of what we're seeing uh, as an impact of prostate cancer screening, and importantly, as a cessation of screening, is really important. Now, one thing that was not discussed at all by the tax, task force, at all, is the impact of metastatic prostate cancer. So when they looked at the screening test, they looked at the impact on overall survival, deaths from any cause, and deaths from prostate cancer. But one very important benefit of PSA screening is that in the 80s, when you took the entire population of men that were diagnosed with prostate cancer, about one in four were diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer at presentation. So when they were first diagnosed with prostate cancer, they already had cancer in their lymph nodes, cancer in their bones, which can be very, very impactful from a quality of life standpoint, from a healthcare utilization standpoint. Avoiding metastatic prostate cancer is a tremendously good thing. Once PSA was introduced, the number of cases of metastatic disease dropped dramatically. And it became very consistent from the mid-1990s on 
that now about 5% of the newly diagnosed population had metastatic prostate cancer at presentation. So we went from 1 in 4 to 1 in 20. So we did a thought experiment where we said, well, gosh, what if we just stopped screening? What if we stopped screening altogether, no one got PSA anymore? How long would it take to go back to these pre-PSA rates of having metastatic disease at presentation? And it would take about 13 years. So after about 13 years, if we just stopped screening with PSA in this country, we would see that same one in four rate of having metastatic disease at presentation, which is notably impactful and not really robustly discussed. So what, what can we do? You know, I think one thing that really did happen with the USPSTF recommendation is that it caused us to take a more critical evaluation of our practices as prostate cancer clinicians. And so one thing we can do is we can screen smarter. And so what I mean by that is, you know, I haven't really talked about the U.S. trial. And one big problem with the U.S. trial is it did not compare patients who got PSA with patients who didn't get PSA. It really compared patients who had an aggressive regimen of getting annual PSAs with patients that got more sort of occasional PSAs. And they both did really well. And, and so if you look at that trial, one thing that it may tell us is that, you know, we don't really need to do aggressive PSA screening. We know from the European trial that there's a benefit to some PSA screening, but we don't necessarily need to do aggressive PSA screening. So um, Ruth and our team did some modeling to look at sort of how we can screen smarter to try to reduce the number of men that are diagnosed with prostate cancer that shouldn't have been or didn't need to be but still maximize that population of patients whose life could potentially be saved from prostate cancer screening. And we went through 35, 40 different scenarios of prostate cancer screening. And what we learned is that you probably don't need to be screened on an annual basis. Every other year, even every four years, depending on what your PSA is, is probably adequate if you look at the population of prostate cancer patients. We also maybe need to think about the cutoffs that we use. And so there's this concept of age-related PSA. You know, as we get older, our prostates get bigger, as, as I am Joe said. And so as our prostate gets bigger, there is a more non-cancerous explanation for why your PSA may be climbing. And so if we use more age-related targets, that might allow us to capture the younger men at risk of potentially dying from prostate cancer and not overcapture older men who likely are not going to be impacted by a new prostate cancer diagnosis. Maybe we can also treat smarter. And Dr. Lin is going to talk about this in our session. But you know, one thing that was highlighted by the task force was the fact that our treatments have notable quality of life impact. So again, if you know, your prostate were just hanging off of your shoulder, it would be no big deal to remove someone's prostate. But your prostate is kind of the epicenter of the genitourinary tract. You know, it sits below the bladder. So any treatment like radiation can impact your bladder function. It sits right above your sphincter muscle. So even if you have a perfect surgery, there is going to be at least some temporary impact on your continence. The sexual function nerves run right alongside the outer aspect of the prostate. So again, even if you have a perfect treatment with radiation or surgery, there is going to be some impact to your sexual function and it sits right above your rectum. When we do prostate cancer surgery, we have to push your rectum down to get the prostate out. So if it didn't have this sort of critical location, it would not be as impactful a thing to treat, but the reality is that it is. So how can we treat smarter? Well, this is a recent publication using United Healthcare data, and it showed that still, as recently as 2006, we are very aggressive in treating prostate cancer. This was an update from some data from an, a registry called CAPTURE, and we'll talk about CAPTURE a bit in the second session, but it showed essentially the same thing, that the number of people in the gray boxes, in these lower gray boxes, that have conservative management strategies for clinically localized prostate cancer, it looks like it's decreasing, not increasing. Our brethren in the urologic community still are very aggressive about treating prostate cancer. And so what we need to do is we need to be more selective. We need to identify appropriate candidates for active surveillance, and that way we're going to diminish the harms of prostate cancer treatment. 
Now, I think, you know, as we reflect on these recommendations, I think that the task force recommendation certainly understates the broad population benefit of PSA screening. It's hard to argue that PSA screening has not had an impact on prostate cancer mortality and the rate of metastatic disease at presentation. Um, I think it does overstate the harms of screening. I think it overstates the harms of treatment. I think it looks at sort of a 90s approach to treatment. And even though our treatments are better, I also would argue that the harms of our treatments are less than they used to be. And, and really importantly, it ignores the impact of metastatic disease. Anyone who treats metastatic prostate cancer can tell you that you know, metastatic prostate cancer, even if it's something whose lifespan is not going to be ca the cause of death in that individual, is a horribly impactful thing for that person to navigate. I do think, however, it puts pressure on us to be better clinicians, to be better doctors, to screen smarter and to treat smarter, and Dr. Lin is going to talk a bit about that. But there are also some truths in screening that they seem to ignore. And the truth of screening in general, prostate cancer, any cancer, any chronic disease, is that really a small proportion of patients with a cancer are going to die of that cancer. A good screening test, an excellent test, is still only going to reduce a person's risk of dying from that cancer by a small amount. There is no perfect screening test that is going to eliminate you know, death from disease and also eliminate overtreatment. It's just not possible. With prostate cancer screening, it's true that we might diagnose 15 to 20 percent of the population and really only help one percent. But that's actually not a bad ratio. It sounds bad, but that's actually pretty consistent with a good screening test. And so the truth is that most of the cases that are diagnosed based on PSA screening may not be helped by it. But that does not mean that on a population level it's not an important test. I hope that makes sense. And so really when you look at it, screening by nature is imperfect. Because when you screen, you hope to overcapture low risk cases because you're trying to catch everyone at risk of dying of their cancer. And so by necessity, you're also going to capture some men who aren't at risk of dying from their prostate cancer. But that doesn't mean it's a bad test. And so this is the work of the CISNET group, which is a modeling group that's coordinated here at the Hutch. But I also just wanted to take one quick slide to talk about some sort of higher level things that are happening with prostate cancer screening. So in 2012, when the USPSTF recommendation came out, Kathleen Sebelius, who was the director of um, Health and Human Services, explicitly stated that Medicare will continue to cover PSA screening. And private payers, Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, a lot of the private payers that you think